many that misunderstand scripture and choose not to adhere to the biblical jurisprudence or a line upon line or precept upon precept method of investigating Bible truths will use two passages out of context to evangelize a lie regarding the law of God. The passages they say claim it is a sin or a curse to keep the law of God are as follows. For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Seeing how these verses seem to contradict themselves would be the first red flag most Christians would decide warrants further study. For example, in Galatians 3.10, it appears that the first half of the passage is saying those that keep the law are cursed. Yet, the second half reveals the exact opposite. Looking at Romans 3.20, we see the same scenario as well. So what's going on here? If you research this using a parallel Bible that shows word for word these passages in both English as well as Greek, you will find something quite amazing. There is a word missing in both those verses. The word EK is missing. The English translation of that word is outside. So looking at those two verses again with that word placed where it belongs, we see why the devil removed it. truth is, if one does the line upon line and precept upon precept, as Isaiah suggested in chapter 28 of his book, we would see many verses prove both passages were missing a word. My favorite verse that validates all this is from Romans chapter 2. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. If you still think Galatians 3.10 and Romans 2.20 are saying you cannot be justified by keeping the law of God, then you need to rip out a lot of verses that say otherwise. Okay, Shalom. All praises to the Most High, the Heavenly Father, uh, through His Son, the Anointed Savior. We come together once again to bring out another empowering message. Through the Spirit of the Most High, may the eyes and ears of all the viewers be uh, opened. So what today we're going to touch on is the, um, the sequel to the trap of Paul's epistles. The Most High, through the Spirit of the Most High, it was revealed on how we have to be cautious when we're dealing with Paul's epistles. Because a lot of those um, uh, 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 letters and a lot of those verses and scriptures inside of his epistles can be taken the wrong way to promote wickedness. So that's what that um, video was to show you that how you have to be wary of how you interpret those letters. But of course, there's always people out there that are more subtle than any beast of the field and they're always trying to catch more people and bring them to the wickedness or to the dark side. So with this video, we're going to put an end to all misunderstanding regarding the epistles of Paul, because you're going to find out in this video that you have to make a choice. There's going to be no more room for a, a, a open discussion once we finish this video. There's no more open discussion after we do this. You're going to have to pick sides on who's lying, because you're going to find out somebody's lying. Somebody's lying, and you're going to have to pick, and your 
whoever you pick, your decision and what you go forth and do is gonna have to reflect your decision. We can't have it both ways. That's what we're gonna find out. It's either Paul's lying or the Christian church is lying. The modern day Christian church, Christianity. Somebody's lying, that's what we're gonna find out. So without further ado, let's get right to it. And then you're gonna have to make a choice. I'm Brother Yerushalam. This is the Bible Unlocked. Paul versus Christianity. Somebody's lying. Acts 21 verse 18. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So now the setting is we have Paul getting together with James and the elders, and he's giving them a report on how his ministry is going with the Gentiles. And he's letting them know that there's been a lot of conversions among the Gentiles. Follow me. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Now we have the elders telling Paul their report saying, can you see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe on Christ? That's what it's, that's what it's referring to. And in addition to that, believing on Christ, they are all zealous of the law because you had to have both of them. That's what the disciples of Christ understood. I don't know about today in this modern Christianity, but according to the ones who walk with Christ, you needed to believe and be zealous of the law. You needed to keep God's commandments and believe on Christ. So now they're giving the report back to Paul. So this is what the scenario is that's going on. And they are informed of thee that thou teaches all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying, they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And these Jews that believe and keep the law have been hearing these rumors about you, Paul, that you're teaching Israelites that are among the Gentiles that they don't have to keep none of the, uh, none of the commandments. You're going to find out that this is the same accusation that the modern Christian church is saying. It's the same thing that Paul's about to go through right now in his trial that we're going to go through. People have been hearing that this brother Paul is going around teaching uh, some Roman Catholicism. That we don't have to keep the commandments. We've been hearing, brother, that you teaching this Christianity, or this modern day Christianity, this Roman Christianity. That's basically what it's saying in, 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 in a nutshell. Is that what these brothers have been hearing? What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. The multitude is gonna hear that you have come into town, and they're gonna wanna know what's going on. They're gonna wanna confront you. You're gonna have a lot of people that's getting ready to come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them. We have four men that have a vow on them. What is this vow? It's talking about a Nazarite vow. You read about this in Numbers, the sixth chapter. Showing you that the, the disciples of Christ were still keeping the law after his death. I'm not sure where these people are coming up with this stuff that like, as of no one, everyone just start being lawless after Christ's death. They were still keeping the law. Four men have a vow on them. They're telling Paul, take these men and purify thyself with them. Because you're gonna read in Acts 18 verse 18, Paul already had a vow on him as well. Paul took a vow already in three chapters, uh, 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 three chapters prior. So they're telling Paul, you have a vow already? We have four other men that have a vow already. Take these men and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, that they may shave their heads because part of the vow is letting your hair grow. You can't let a razor touch your head. So that's part of the law that Paul was keeping and the other four men were keeping as well. So he says, take them and the purification process when they're getting ready to end the vow, then they shave their head to signify the purification. 
And it says the Biad charges with them, meaning you're gonna, Paul is in charge of paying for these people's sacrifices. Because there's a sacrifice, as we'll keep reading, that goes along with this vow. And Paul was to be the one to pay for it. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. And when Paul did this, it was supposed to show the people, the multitude that's coming together to check him out and see what he's teaching. It was supposed to show them that Paul is a law keeper. And Paul's not running around teaching people, you don't have to keep the law. That's what they're telling, that's what they were telling Paul to do. He said, you need to do this, brother. So these people, when they come, they say, okay, well, this must be some misunderstanding that we have. This brother's really teaching the law, uh, teaching the commandments, and he's following the commandments. And notice that they didn't even ask, they didn't even ask him, is this true, this accusation we've been hearing? Because they knew that this wasn't true. So it was no need for them to even ask him. They just say, listen, this is what we heard, and this is what you need to do. They didn't even ask him, well, is this true that you were running around wild teaching that people can be lawless since Christ died? Now, let's continue reading and see what happens. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. So the elders say unto the Gentiles, we told them that they didn't have to keep all the law. And then he gives the list on the things that they concluded that the Gentiles had to keep. We told them that, but the Israelites, we ne nobody ever wrote that the Israelites are, are been teaching that the Israelites don't have to keep the commandments. Now let's find out what Paul says after the elders have brought this accusation up. Let's find out if Paul's gonna whip out a Galatians 3 verse 24, or let's find out what he's getting ready, how, what his response is into this accusation being brought forth. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple. Wait, you telling me Paul didn't whip out a Romans 10 verse nine? All you have to do is believe? You telling me Paul didn't stand up and say, hold on. You know what elders, I'm gonna be honest with you. I am running around teaching we don't have to keep the law. And this is why, Romans 10 verse nine. You telling me Paul didn't stand up? Cause this is what the Christian church is teaching that Paul is teaching in his epistles that people can just be lawless and don't have to keep any, any of the commandments. Paul didn't even respond. Paul went right to it and said, and went right into, uh, grabbed the men and went into the temple and did what the elders uh, uh, told them. So this is where we're gonna start running into a dilemma. Because Paul didn't say anything. Paul didn't, say, he didn't speak up for this, I'm not, t uh, uh, this, this doctrine that we don't have to keep the commandments, which he was accused of doing. And if that's what he was teaching, that's what he should have stood up and said. Let's continue, because it gets better. To signify the accomplishment of the days of purification, until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. See, an offering had to be offered for each one of the four men and Paul. This signified the, the end of the purification process. What was the sacrifice that needed to be uh, made? You read about it in number six. Numbers, the sixth chapter. He needed a ewe lamb, a he lamb, a ram, um, a, a basket of uh, unleavened bread, cakes mingled with oil, meat and drink offerings. This is what Paul was paying for when it said to be at charges with, uh, with the four men. Paul was paying for that. And now they're getting ready to, to um, do the sacrifice. Watch. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were in Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him. Now they caught Paul, the ones that was making these complaints, running around spreading these rumors. They said, there you go right there. That's that brother right there. Yep, mm-hmm, I can see him. That's him. Then they stirred up all the rest of the people and then they went and laid hands on him right before he was getting to uh, 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 finish the vow. So he didn't even get a chance to finish the vow because they snatched him up out of the temple, crying out, men of Israel, 
help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people. This is the man that's teaching there is neither Jew nor Greek, and that everyone's all equal and it's all one big melting pot, and that it doesn't matter who God's people are anymore. This is the guy teaching. What you're gonna find out is the people accusing Paul has the same exact interpretation as the modern Christian church. That's what you're gonna find out. Watch and the law, and he's teaching people that they don't have to keep the law. He's running around here telling people that all they have to do is sit back and believe. They can be homosexuals, they can be thieves, murderers, all they gotta do is believe. Don't worry about keeping that law. And this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and had polluted the holy place. And he's bringing Gentiles into the temple, Greeks, uh, Caucasians or Europeans, into the temple and profaning it. Because the custom was that the Gentiles were not allowed to come into the temple. They had to stay on the outer court. You can read about that in Revelations 11 verse two. The outer court was for the Gentiles. The Gentiles can't come into the temple, to the inner court of the temple. So this was a major offense that they were a, a, a raisin against Paul. Because this offense was punishable by death. So this was not something small, that these are not small accusations that they're raising against Paul. They said, this is the man that's doing this. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Because they saw Paul in an earlier instance, a few chapters back, with an Ephesian or a Gentile, natural Gentile, Trophimus, and they supposed that he brought this Gentile into the temple. They supposed. They didn't see it. They supposed. But Paul knew better than to bring Gentiles into the inner court because that was punishable by death. And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. And they drew Paul out of the temple, snatched him by his afro and everything, grabbed him straight up out of the temple, say, come on over here. You the one who's been doing this, come on out. Now let's continue going on further and we're gonna find out that Paul's gonna get put up on trial for this indictment. And we're gonna find out what Paul says about it. If it, these accusations are true or if they're not. Let's go. Acts chapter 24 verse one. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders and with a certain orator named Tertullius who informed the governor against Paul. So now we have Paul in front of the Roman orator who's now telling the governor all the indictment charges against Paul and why he's being brought up on these charges. Verse five, for we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also have gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. Is they're saying that Paul is running around causing uproars? He's, a, um, he's seditious, he's a pestilent fellow, and that this brother is, is problematic. So we need to find something to um, charge him with because he's running around causing all these problems. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou have been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do more cheerfully answer for myself. So now finally after all this ruckus, Paul standing in front of the governor and he's finally for the first time getting his chance to finally say something. He says, I'm going to answer for myself. So it doesn't matter what anybody else is talking about right now. All the accusations that's being brought forth, we're going to find out what Paul says out of his own mouth. We're going to find out if Paul was teaching, you don't have to keep the commandments, or if they were lying on him. Let's find out from the horse's own mouth. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people 
neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things which they accuse me. So Paul says, 12 days ago, I was just at Jerusalem worshiping. And they, meaning these Jews that's accusing me, they saw me there. And I wasn't disputing with anyone. I wasn't bothering anyone. All these claims that they're uh, uh, um, bringing forth, he says, they cannot prove. The, trying to say that I've been teaching that, that no one has to keep the laws and the customs of the Jews. He says, these people cannot prove. But this I confess unto thee. But this is what I'm going to say to you. This is my confession. That after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Paul says he believed all things, not some things, not a few things, not a knick-knack, patty-whack, give a dog a bone, not no small things here and there. He says he believes all things written in the law and the prophets. What does that mean? If somebody brought him Leviticus 20 verse 13, if they were sitting there on the judgment, uh, a seat in the court and said, Paul, here's Leviticus 20 verse 13. Do you believe this? Where it says a man shall not lie with mankind. If he does so, he shall, he shall be put to death. Do you believe this? Paul would have said, yes, I believe that, according to his own words. In the prophets, if somebody would have brought him um, uh, uh, Isaiah 14, verse 1 th uh, through 2, and said, where it says that all the um, enemies of Israel are going into captivity, Paul, do you believe this? He would have said, yes. So how is it that we're getting Paul saying he believes the law and the prophets, and then in the epistles, people are trying to make it seem like he's teaching against the law and the prophets. This is why I say, this is the dilemma we're getting ready to run into, and it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Because you can't have it both ways. That's what you're going to find out. You can't have it both ways. Either Paul is lying right here when he's on the stand, or Christianity's lying. Somebody's going to be lying, though. Somebody's going to be the liar. Let's get some more. Acts chapter 25, verse 1. Now when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Who's Festus? He's the successor of Felix, the last Roman procurator. So now we have Festus coming down, and now he's about to deal with Paul. Verse 6. And when he had tarried among them, more than 10 days he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. So now we have Paul getting ready to be brought in front of Festus. Let's see how this plays out. Let's see if Paul switches up his story this time, or if he sticks with the same story he's, he, uh, he just taught in front, of, um, uh, 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 in front of Felix. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about, and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. What were the complaints that they laid against Paul? Paul's teaching that you don't have to keep the law. Paul's bringing Gentiles into the um, temple. Those are the complaints that they were laying against Paul. And it says that they could not prove it. Let you know that somebody's lying here. This is the same accusation, you gotta find out, this is the same accusation that the modern Christian church is bringing against Paul. You're both doing the same thing. But the difference is, these people were trying to get Paul put to death. The modern Christian church is trying to glorify him because you're lawless. It's the same exact thing. You both have the same exact accusation. While he answered for himself, while he answered for himself, I don't want to hear the answer from the Christian pastor. I don't want to hear the, the answer from the theologian. I don't want to hear the answer for myself. I don't want to hear anybody speak for Paul. I want to hear Paul speak for himself. That's what I want to hear right now. Let's find out what he says when he answered for himself. Neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended anything at all. Paul says, I did not offend anything at all against keeping the commandments, against bringing Gentiles into the temple, and against the, um, the king, which was uh, or, or the Caesar, Nero at the time. 
This is out of his own mouth. What does this mean? If we would have brought him Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and says, well, what are you about this then? You just said all you, uh, if you believe and you confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Paul would have said that is not what, that's not saying that you don't have to keep the commandments. That's what Paul would have came and told you. That don't mean that. He says it right here. Neither against the law or anything have I offended at all. He says at all. Somebody's lying here, ladies and gentlemen. Somebody's lying. Somebody's lying. Either Paul is sitting up here right now being a bold-faced liar and he's being a coward and not standing up for what he believes or the Christian church is purposely lying on him. Somebody's lying though. Somebody's lying. And I'm going to tell you right now, the burden of proof is no longer on people teaching that you have to keep the commandments. Now the burden of proof is on all you out there who's trying to teach lawlessness. The burden of proof is on you because you try to present one of those scriptures, one of these vague scriptures from Paul's epistles that can be interpreted so many different ways. When you try to present that, I'm not going anywhere else. We're going to stay right here. I'm going to bring this up where Paul says against the law or against the temple or against the king. He says he's never offended at all. I'm going to bring this up first and I'm going to ask you, do you believe Paul? That's my question. Do you believe Paul? Do you believe Paul when he says this? That's what, we, that's what I want to know first. Do you believe Paul when he says this? Or, only, or are you only believing Paul when it fits your agenda? When it's something that you can take and make it say whatever you want it to say and justify being wicked? When, when do, you, do you believe Paul all the way? Or do you believe Paul only when it fits you? That's what we want to know. Which one is it? I'm not going, and I'm not budging either. I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, you need to do the same thing. When somebody try to present these scriptures talking about uh, uh, any one of these Romans, whatever, or Galatians, whatever, no. We're going to go right here and ask, do you believe Paul when he says he never uh, offended against the law at all? He never spoke against the law at all. On trial. Because the two options are, if you believe Paul, if you believe him right now when he's saying he never spoke against the law, that means in his epistles, what you need to do is you need to interpret those epistles to correspond to what he's saying here in order to not make him a contradiction. Because now he's contradicting himself and he's being the devil, if that's the case. Now you're being the devil. You're lying over here. You're, not, you're being a coward lying over here. Uh, on the judgment seat saying, oh, I'm not teaching that. I'm not teaching that. And then when you get off, you're teaching people, uh, yeah, I'm teaching you don't have to keep the commandments. That's the devil. That's being a liar. That's a deceiver. And if that's how you feel, and if that's what you believe Paul's doing, you don't need to be dealing with none of his letters. You don't need to be dealing with anything that he's, that he's dealing with. And if you say you do believe Paul, that means you need to make his letters correspond to what he's saying. You only got two choices, that's it. You only got two choices, and some people out there are just so wicked that they'll say they don't believe what he's saying here and still use his letters for doctrine. When it's dealing with your soul salvation, you don't need to be dealing with discrepancies like that. Well, when he's lying here and telling people, he's lying to the people here, but then he's uh, telling people something else over here. You don't need to be dealing with people like that if that's how you feel the situation is. So you got a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Nobody wants to deal with this on Paul on the trial. Nobody wants to deal with this. Everyone want to skip over this where Paul is blatantly telling, he's flat out telling you, I'm not speaking against the law. Somebody's lying, ladies and gentlemen. Let's continue. Verse 9. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? See, Festus was in league with the Jews. They were all trying to get him set up to come down Jerusalem to be judged there because they know they were going to catch him there. 
They were gonna, they, they were, you know, they, they, they know that they were gonna pull some type of trial out and find him guilty. Even if the brother wasn't guilty, they were still gonna make a way to find him guilty. So they were all in league with each other at this point. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Paul says, I'm not a fool. I'm standing right here. Because it's, it's obvious what you brothers are trying to do. It's obvious what y'all are trying to do. Y'all can't prove anything that you're saying and you're still trying to get me to go down to Jerusalem to get judged. You have to be out of your mind. I'm staying right here. That's what Paul says. You can go pull that stuff on someone else, but it's not working here. I've been around the game way too long where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong as thou very well knowest. Paul says you know it. You. You know it. And the Christian church too. You know he didn't offend anything against the Jews. You know it. And if you don't know it and if you don't believe it, you need to leave Paul alone. You can't be using Paul and, and, and making it um, a contradict itself when you're dealing with people's salvation. That's inconsiderate and disingenuous. You can't have it both ways. You can't have the ice cream and the cake. You gotta pick one. Either he's lying or he's not lying. Somebody's lying though. Somebody's not telling the truth. Somebody's only telling half the story. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death. If I'm an offender, if I'm teaching in Romans 10 verse 9 or uh, uh, Romans 3 verse 20 that you don't have to keep none of the laws, if I'm teaching in any of my epistles that you don't have to teach no laws and you don't have to keep no commandments, if that's my intent when I wrote these letters, I refuse not to die. Put me to death right now. If that's what I'm doing, I need to be put to death. That's what he's saying. I need to be put to death. If I'm offending and I'm doing that against the law, put me to death right now. If I'm bringing Gentiles into the temple, put me to death right now. He says, I refuse not to die. I refuse not to die. That's a strong statement right there. He didn't say, you, you can go ahead and kill me. He says, I refuse not to die. Meaning, go ahead and take me, man. If, if, if that's what I'm doing, go ahead and take me because I need to be put to death. Because Paul says he believed everything in the law and the prophets. And it tells you in the law, if somebody comes around telling you, let's go worship other gods, which is what the modern Christian church is doing, telling you to come away from the Most High and go and worship the Babylonian God, the God of the Roman Catholic Church, he, it says the judgment is they need to be put to death. Paul says, I refuse to die. So it's either Paul is, if Paul's lying right here, nobody needs to be dealing with him. If you believe Paul is lying, nobody needs to be dealing with him. But the choice is, if you don't believe he's lying, don't bring me no Romans 10 verse nothing and try to say that Paul's teaching against the commandments because now you're contradicting him. You're doing the same thing that the Jews were doing back then to him, trying to catch him up and false, uh, falsely accusing him. You're doing the same thing. You're doing the same exact thing. You're no different. And Paul is going through a, he's going through a rough, stressful time right now, trying to clear his name from these people accusing him. And then now you got two point something billion people doing the same thing. It's amazing how it works, doing the same thing. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. But I'm not gonna die for something that I didn't do. See, if I did it, I refuse not to die, but you're not gonna get me for something I didn't do. See, that's the difference. I'm not gonna die innocently. Th that don't make any sense. That's just stupidity. I'm not gonna volunteer myself to be put to death if I'm not doing it. So once again, if they brought him Ephesians anything, Galatians anything, any one of those scriptures in his epistle and said, what about this right here, brother? You just said right here, we're not justified by the law, we're under grace. What, what does that mean? 
He would have said that does not mean you don't have to keep the law. That's what he would have said. He would, and then he would explain to them what he was saying or what his intent was. He says, I'm not dying, I'm not dying like a dummy. You're gonna have to bring up some, some, some legit accusations and be able to prove them if I'm gonna uh, 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 willingly uh, get put to death. I'm not That's the story of Paul, ladies and gentlemen. That's Paul's conclusion of the whole matter. That's what Paul says out of his own mouth. Paul says, I'm not teaching against the commandments. These people are accusing Paul of teaching against the commandments, but Paul out of his own mouth is saying, I'm not doing that. So we got two choices to make and nobody's gonna get off the hook with this. We're not going anywhere else. I'm telling you, I'm dead serious with this. We're not going anywhere else. I wanna know what you believe. I wanna know if you really believe Paul. This is, this is where you're gonna uh, 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 uncover all these hidden demons that's inside of people. They're gonna start coming out and manifesting themselves. And trust me, I've seen it already. You think people believe in the scriptures and believe in the Bible one, one moment, then once, you, once the truth start coming out, all of a sudden they don't believe anymore. All of a sudden the book is full of myths, full of fairy tales, and all this other extra stuff. They don't believe anymore. I've seen it personally. Because that's what the truth does. It start digging demons out that are, that, that, are, that are laying dormant within you. Because there's a lot of demons that's getting ready to come out now that there's no way, there's no, there's no back door to run out, run out of on this now. Because now you're trapped in a corner. See, that's, that's how the Most High is giving the wisdom out in these last days where we're going to have to make decisions. Your faith is going to have to be tested. What you believe in is going to have to be tested. There's no escaping it. What do you believe? What do you believe? Because if you believe Paul is telling the truth, I don't want to hear about you saying anything about Paul said, we don't have to do this. No Colossians 2.16 or any of that stuff. Interpret it the way it's meant, it was meant to be interpreted. To reflect what he said here on the judgment seat. And if he's lying, you don't need to be following him. If you believe he's lying, you don't need to be following him. Who's going to be following a coward? Who's going to follow a coward? All the other prophets got put to death for this word, standing up firm for what they believe in. Paul is not exempt from that. If he believed that we don't have to keep the commandments, when on, on the judgment seat, he should have jumped up with a Romans whatever and said, all you got to do is believe. Now, come put me to death. Do something about it. Do something about it. That's what I believe in. I believe Christ died on the cross for everyone else to be lawless. And we don't have to keep no commandments. All we got to do is believe. Do something about it. I'm willing to die right now. That's what we should have seen in this trial. That's what we should have seen Paul come out and do. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He spoke the way he formatted his speech was in league with everyone else in the scriptures. All from Moses all the way on up to Christ. And all the other elders that were telling him that the Jews believe and they keep the law. That's how he formatted his, uh, 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 his rebuttal to the accusations that they, were bringing, uh, that they were bringing forth. Which makes me say, okay, well I'm going to take this brother's word for it. I'm going to take this brother's word for it because truth be told, no one could... Um, um, you, you, that's all you can do is take, take his word for it. We can, the, all his epistles are, there's many interpretations that can be put on those. Why? Because we don't have, the, 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 um, the records are incomplete. We don't have what the churches wrote to him. We don't have all of the letters that he wrote. All we have is one form of communication. We have one form or one prospect of the communication team being taken place. We don't have the letters that he wrote back or that they wrote back to him. We don't have the letters. And when you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, it tells you that he's responding to a letter. He says uh, uh, and, uh, it's a response to the letter that they wrote to him. Well, where's that letter at that they wrote to him? 
So we don't have the full conclusion of what's going on. So nobody's, so people claiming to be some expert on Paul, you're not some expert on Paul. You can't be expert, an expert on something that you don't have, you, you, can't, you can't just chime in halfway through the conversation and think you know everything that's going on. The fact is we don't know what's going on. Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthians. How many do we have in the scriptures? We got two. We got two letters out of four. And someone jumping in talking about they think they know everything. No, that's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. So the only thing we can do is go off of what the brother said. At least that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to, but I'm going to be honest with you. There's brothers out there that have a strong case saying that Paul is lying. And it's a solid case. I'll be unbiased with it. I'll tell you the truth. I'll be, I'll be objective. They have a strong case. The Christian church has a, has a case, but the Christian church is minute to what other brothers who actually study the scriptures, they have the, a strong case for it. But I'm not going to go with that because I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to take the risk of him telling the truth. I'm going to take his word for it, and that's how I'm going to interpret his epistles. I'm going to interpret his epistles to make, to not um, uh, uh, defame his name as the other Jews and all other Christianity is doing already. I think that's unfair for someone to do. But the difference is the brothers that teach that he's lying, they don't deal with the epistles of Paul. That's the difference between them and the Christian church. They say we're not dealing with it at all. We're going to stick to what we know and what's clear versus going to something that we that, that's not all the way clear. So, ladies and gentlemen, we got a decision to make. I'm going to tell you that right now. There's a decision to make. That's all I want to hear. What do you believe? I don't want to hear no other scriptures. What do you believe? Do you believe Paul? Is Paul telling the truth or is he lying? And then after you make that decision, everything else that you bring out with Paul better reflect that decision. Until next time, we give praise and honor to the Most High. I'm Brother Yerushalayim, and I say Shalom. There's a lot of confusion about faith and works. If you are keeping the law in an attempt to gain entrance into heaven, you'll never get in. We are saved by grace through faith. This is essential to understand. Once you understand this, you must understand that a belief in Christ does not produce evil works. Christ came to free us from our sins. He did not only die for our sins that we may be forgiven, but he also came to cleanse us from all evil. If we are cleansed from evil, then we will do good. Is not God's law good? Romans 7, 12 says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So, is a murder, or adultery, or theft, good or bad? They're bad things, right? Those are sin. Those are evil, and that is what Christ came to free us from. John chapter 8, verses 34 to 36 says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. What about the Sabbath? Let me ask, is it good to break God's law? Why is it bad to steal, but it's not bad to disobey God and rest specifically when he told us to? This, my friends, is what it's all about. Will you obey God or not? We can theoretically be called a good person for refusing to steal and refusing to lie and refusing to murder. But the line of separation is drawn between those who keep the Sabbath and those who do not. It comes down to obedience. There is one class who obeys God and does whatever He commands, and there is another class who does not obey God. This is what the Sabbath is about. Obedience. 
regardless of how insignificant you may think it is, though it is not. It is a requirement of the worshiper of God to keep the Sabbath. Will you keep his law or not? Will you accept the mark of the beast or will you accept the seal of God? You get one choice. Choose wisely. Joshua chapter 24 verse 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is it good to you to obey God? Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 to 12 says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Who are those that won't receive the mark of the beast? Those that keep the commandments of God. All of them, including the Sabbath and have faith in Christ. Not those who disobey God's commandments.